officially get started. So it's a pleasure to have, you know, Samir from Dexterity along with Harry and Jonathan present to us. So Samir was a PhD student at Stanford working with Osama Satib. And, you know, he built many robots, he did some control and at some point he decided the best way to do robotics is to, you know, really do it in the real world and build a company. So he co-founded Dexterity a couple of years back. And, you know, they have been doing a bunch of cool things. And, you know, I'm very excited to hear about them. Then Jonathan was also a PhD from Stanford. So I guess, you know, I guess Dexterity largely became a Stanford company, but I guess it's changing <laughs> slowly with time. And maybe, you know, some folks over here might also want to, you know, go join in. And Harry was at USC before doing his PhD, and then he joined Dexterity, I guess, two years now, Harry? Three, almost three. Almost three, wow. <laughs> Great. So with that, I'll hand it over to Samir, Jonathan, and Harry, and looking forward. Please take it away. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Pulkit, and I uh, did want to say uh, thank you to all the folks who joined in. Um, as you can tell, we're probably pretty excited about robotics. We've been working on robotics at Dexterity for, I believe, for three and a half years, a little over. And before that, I spent uh, almost a decade at Stanford. Uh, if people are familiar with uh, Osama. He's uh, an expert in uh, robot manipulation. And uh, we folks who join his lab tend to love him so much that they stay for a long, long time. So I had this like 10-year PhD where... Uh, worked on a human motor control in a uh, in a variety of contexts, be it uh, modeling, um, uh, dynamics, biomechanics, some haptics, and combination of neuroscience. And I think we were getting uh, to a point where I felt technology has been in, in in robotics in particular has been under constant flux for the past few decades. There were a lot of foundational things done uh, by Osama's lab, by um, Professor Hogan and Neville, who's also in the audience, I believe, uh, and all the way through the 80s, the, through the 90s. The foundations, I think, were very solid. I think the past couple of decades have seen dramatic advances in computer vision, machine learning, where it, it really, uh, I think, has come to a head. And I, I believe we do have the modules for taking robotics out into the real world uh, to step on the shoulders of uh, all the giants who've uh, you know, made life easy for us now. And what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is, is, is you know, something that I would say uh, builds upon decades and decades of work in robotics. So I'm going to talk about a lot of things. It, it's uh, not a super academic talk. Um, we are still at a company, and so it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, we share more of what we do and less of how we do it. Uh, we're happy to answer questions at the very end. So that's the context from us. And I think uh, what you're seeing in the background over here are a few of our robots. I think if you pay attention, you'll see robots uh, that are sorting parcels. You'll see robots uh, that are picking cosmetics, robots uh, that are uh, dealing with some uh, tricky uh, manipulation challenges. Um, robots that are working together, mobile robots, autonomous robots, with, uh, autonomous perception. Uh, as we move along, you'll see the robots also have uh, force perception, not just visual perception. There's uh, a lot that goes into this. Robotics at Dexterity has been a very full stack engineering initiative. So we have folks working on the hardware, the software, and the algorithms, the machine learning, the controls, uh, the vision. Uh, the distributed systems, network level, sort of scheduling, approximation algorithms for how to pack um, boxes and the kind, and a lot of other cool stuff. So uh, to dive in, quick introduction for the talk and uh, the people on our team. Uh, when we're talking about robot dexterity in the real world, I'll start off by maybe uh, sharing some context uh, for logistics in particular. Logistics was a very interesting application area for us. It's been an outstanding opportunity for robots to step out of the lab and be constructive and add value. Uh, we're gonna 
maybe share that context, share a few of the critical technical pieces that we felt were necessary for us to take robots out of the lab and into the real world. Jonathan is going to dig into one particular application, which is uh, box packing or mixed case palletizing, as it's called in the industry. Uh, it's a hard problem. And Jonathan's going to share why it's hard and uh, share a variety of interesting tidbits about what it takes to get it done. A big th thrust for us right now is to open out, um, you know, what are from our perspective outstanding challenges facing robotics. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that as well. I do want to make sure we seed ideas so that uh, a lot of really smart people in the audience have something to think about when they go home. You know, I'm sure some of you dream about robotics. And uh, I would hope that you dream about how to pack big piles of boxes and uh, sometimes things that are not boxes within those, <laughs> within those uh, piles as well. Uh, we're going to follow that with Harry uh, talking about um, uh, giving us a glimpse into the fossil sorting you know, problem. This is uh, another pretty tricky problem. It's extremely high speed, uh, real time operation of robots that uh, deal with just a, a mind boggling amount of heterogeneity in a dynamic environment. And uh, there's uh, problems in hardware and software and um, controls and vision. And, we're gonna share a flavor of a few of those and uh, round it up with a few nice, uh, interesting robot demonstrations. So let me begin uh, with uh, you know, a review into logistics. So what is uh, logistics all about? I think logistics is, is the backbone of our civilization. We've been through the coronavirus pandemic over the past uh, year and a half and I'm sure a lot of you folks uh, probably recall in the early days of the pandemic, the store shelves um, ran out of, of a lot of items. And once uh, we had this virus come about, there were a lot of things uh, that we take for granted when it comes to the movement of physical goods. Um, and, and a lot of those assumptions were laid bare because it became very difficult to move the physical goods. Also highlighted the sensitivity of our ability um, you know, to operate without relying on a perfectly synchronized logistic system that takes goods from all over the world, uh, gets it to our stores, gets it to our homes. I think uh, folks, of course, uh, the pandemic is in the news a lot, uh, but the logistics industry secretly behind the scenes has been putting in a behemoth effort to make sure that uh, people are well fed, that people are, our houses are stocked with the items that we need. And, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to you know, impress upon us uh, just the sheer necessity of having the logistics enterprise working. Um, okay, so high level context. Robo robots have been around in our society since I would say give or take the 1980s. 1990s, we saw a lot of adoption of robots in, in mass production. Uh, those robots relied on precision, extremely reliable. The problem with robots that rely on precision, however, is that for the robotic precision to be effective, the environment needs to be precise as well. Making the environment precise is expensive because it requires us to set up a very sophisticated assembly lines. And so these precise and reliable robots that we adopted in what I would call the first wave of robotics, um, essentially maxed themselves out by the late 90s, early 2000s in some regard, where a lot of the low hanging fruit in the automotive industry and in the semiconductor uh, industry had, had really become automated very well. Where it was feasible to set up a complex, expensive automation line, robots became hugely successful. Early 2000s, I think there was a pretty interesting shift in attention away from robots that do stuff towards robots that move. Over the past few decades, we've definitely seen the mobility wave of robotics grow up and go from interesting ideas to real world application, be it in drones, uh, Roombas, uh, autonomous cars, autonomous, uh, pretty much anything you can imagine. Um, somebody is doing it out there. That's fantastic. There was um, a pretty solid thrust in, in machine learning and computer vision, as you all know, which really brought, uh, you know, made computer vision mainstream and feasible. You know, the past five to seven years, it's been uh, an interesting idea to take advances over decades and decades and go back uh, to robots that do stuff, uh, but robots that have human-like dexterity and able to do things in the real world, right? So 
let's look at uh, what's going on. I think uh, in Newsflash 2021, for folks who may have noticed, when we think about robots, there's all sorts of tricky issues uh, in, in taking robots out of, into society. Uh, one of the trickiest ones is, you know, is there an unfilled and urgent need? And what we do find is on the back of this pandemic and of course, a lot of other microscopic factors, there's a very severe labor shortage. Uh, in fact, it's, it's interesting that we have high unemployment and there's still a labor shortage. And there are many reasons for that, of course, partially because of uh, the pandemic, partially because uh, newer generations aren't particularly interested in doing highly laborious um, jobs. The consequences of labor shortages lead to inflation, which I myself noticed. I walked into a subway and the sub, all the subs were like a couple of dollars more expensive one day. It's like interesting. I think in a nutshell, there's a core idea, which is an idea that uh, there are many jobs that, that we do today as a society, which perhaps we should reconsider doing. I think I'm a core believer in making mechanical repetition optional for us all. And there's a very, very interesting opportunity right now in that there are many, many things to do and there's nobody to do them. And so that adds a nice little wedge for us. Logistics is particularly hard hit because the jobs tend to be really, really tough. Um, so again, this is just a bit of an insight into logistics, which I did want to share. Uh, folks, when we're working in the lab, it's actually important to try and understand uh, that when we take technology out of the lab and into the real world, it's not just about the sheer technical uh, brilliance of our approach. It's, it's also uh, the adoption of the technology is contingent upon the environment being ready to embrace it. It's lots of jobs, huge accretion, and massive expansion in warehousing, adding even more jobs, which will be even bigger job gaps. And so on the back of it all, when we started Dexterity, uh, I think deep down uh, you know, in, in the company, we wanted to make sure that we have a constructive role to play. And the time is right. It's feasible for us to play a constructive role. We capitalized upon that opportunity, put intelligent robots into production. There's a variety of ways in which uh, they can be helpful and be collaborative helpers. Great. So there's a big problem in logistics, needs a wide variety of things to be done. Uh, the problem is urgent, there's a gap, and I think it's a very positive contribution to solve this problem right now. Uh, let's take a look and, and uh, how things were, and I'll just uh, maybe build up a, a mental framework for how we think about uh, productizing and, and uh, robots and, and, and taking them out into the world. And I'll also use this opportunity uh, to draw a bit of a contrast with a few of the other approaches that, uh, that people might have been exposed to. So we went out and, and, and built a leveling taxonomy for dexterous robots. Of course, this reflects our perspective and perspectives are always a function of the context within which we operate. And we have a vested interest in making sure that uh, we share our perspective. Uh, nevertheless, with the caveats aside, when we look at industrial robots uh, that were uh, you know, designed to operate out of the box in a pre-programmed manner. Uh, they've been there, it's a very stable technology. Let's call it level one. If we go out and look at what a lot of folks are doing today, it has been to take the industrial robotics paradigm, which is like, hey, I'm gonna have a bolted down robot. It's gonna have some well-defined application that it's gonna operate in. I'm gonna throw some computer vision on it. I'm gonna throw maybe some AI into that. And so uh, we call these smart robots, they're still in a box. If you go out in industry, you'll see hundreds now maybe of startups trying to do uh, this kind of stuff. And so we chose to call it level two robotics. The cool thing about level one, level two robots is you buy one, it operates like a toaster. You push one button and it does the same thing pretty much over and over again um, with a limited amount of adaptability or maybe an increased amount of adaptability. This is fantastic. It's uh, it's easy to think about how to apply it within existing industrial functions, uh, but we believe that's not what it's all about. And let's start to peek into uh, warehouses and look at what the real world really looks like. This is one warehouse uh, for folks who are somewhat unfamiliar with warehouses. Um, what I'm gonna do is, is uh, okay, does my mouse cursor visible when I move it? Otherwise I can- Yes, yes it is visible. It is visible, fantastic. So 
uh, for folks, uh, you know, warehouses typically are these big uh, storage locations. Uh, I would, I would broadly uh, the first order bit when it comes to dividing them into two halves. I would say, or uh, some warehouses are focused on on storage, and so the if you take a long term storage facility which has car tires, you pull stuff in. You leave stuff in the warehouse; it sits there for a while. And some warehouses are heavily focused on distribution, uh, which are maybe higher flow. If you think about a parcel a warehouse, uh, you're obviously not storing parcels because if you're storing parcels, you're not doing your job to deliver them. And so, we're gonna stay on the distribution side of warehousing and keep ourselves uh, focused on warehouses that are humming, uh, that are buzzing with work. And so, what typically happens is you have this big big massive facility uh, there's some base for trucks to come in a truck would drive over and there'd be somebody who unloads the truck either onto a pallet or whatever uh, maybe comes in takes items puts them somewhere stores them into these interesting little racks and consequently there's an outbound area where after a while people go to those racks they pick stuff up retrieve it, maybe make a pallet, maybe add a set of cases, prepare it in some way to push, push it back on a truck and send it out. So the job of these warehouses, if you think of them as, as some sort of abstract node in a network, is to connect manufacturing, uh, which creates a uniform uh, distribution, like a uniform set of like the same thing uh, to the end customer who wants a wide variety of, of few things. And, uh, this demixing of, of uh, a unified set of things into uh, sort of uh, smaller and smaller chunks of, of, uh, of items is, is where the real problem is. And when we think about the real world, it's, it's, it's pretty dynamic. Uh, you know, you need to really start to do things that force you to step out of the box in a sense, and the boxy robots don't quite do the job. And so the next level up of, uh, of what we call uh, robot intelligence or robot dexterity, intelligence is a very overloaded word and reluctant to use it most of the time, um, is, is, is to step out of that box, start operating in the real world. And one of the first things that we encounter when we're moving to the real world is a sense of touch. Uh, force control has been a recognized area of research for decades now and to date, it's extremely challenging to deploy anything that involves uh, force control, the sense of touch, or having robots collaborate with each other. Uh, to our knowledge, our, our, our robots are, are, are the only systems that, that actually do this, but uh, we'll talk more about it later. But just to highlight, uh, moving out into places where you're dealing with all these random jumbled racks and whatnot, the first step is really to be able to transcend vision. If, if you purely focus on vision, probably won't solve the problem because half the time you can't see what's going on. Uh, it's too expensive to add 1 million cameras. Things just change all the time. Okay, so that's level three. Uh, level four is when we add collaboration uh, between robots, across robots, and we allow robots to move. Um, what you're seeing over here is a very interesting example. Of two robots working together, they have one axis mobility, um, and uh, joint sort of control where they're using the sense of touch and force control to collaboratively hold uh, this item. This item is a tray full of bread. Uh, if you zoom in, which we can't do right now, it, it's a highly irregular non-convex surface that kind of slots into another highly irregular non-convex surface. Right? And so the robots are working together to basically do non-convex object slotting with force control in a distributed by manual collaboration environment, right? Uh, for folks who worked on robotics, this is extremely hard. Um, I, I, I've seen shades of this in the past, but it's usually, you know, a demo that worked once. We wrote a paper about it and it never worked again. And, uh, on the other hand, now we're at a point where we can do this very reliably, very debatably with, with methods that we have high confidence in. And that's what we call level four, where we really have the ability to take one section of a workflow within some process and, and solve it um, with human level sort of uh, skill and dexterity. Uh, the next level up is uh, something that we are still working on and haven't quite put together, but uh, 
it, it requires us to start thinking of, uh, of robotics in logistics as, as enablers uh, for, for basically managing the flow and distribution of goods across the entire network. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, what that means is when we start off in the manufacturing facility uh, to the point where an item ends up in the hands of a, a user, a person, a customer, whatever you choose to call them, uh, there are many, many places where there's mixing and matching. And uh, when we think about deploying robots, the interesting thing is robots offer a degree of uh, sort of perspective and visibility into at a very granular level that allows us to extract information uh, about the flow of goods and also act upon that information in real time. So level five robotics is, is what we call uh, you know, designing and rethinking the entire manner in which an industry would operate, not just with the perspective to automate things in spots, but with this perspective that automation in spots is a tool for us to intervene in the larger distribution of goods. And if we provide the ability uh, to, to reason about complex network scheduling problems and provide the ability to act upon whatever reasoning that we come up with. Uh, this is a behemoth problem. I, I don't think it's gonna get solved in the near future, but it is something to keep in mind. Few people think about this. And once we get down to the point where robots are going to be adopted at scale, this is going to be a very, very massive contribution whoever works on this. So with that in mind, let's start digging into what dexterity does with this regard. Uh, we are highly focused um, on, on solving problems end to end uh, with a full stack uh, software and hardware approach. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I was always challenged with when, when I was in academia as a PhD student is that uh, while it's feasible for us uh, within the resources that we have and the time constraints that we have uh, to work on theory or to work on simulation, uh, to work on modules of what would constitute a broader engineering effort, it's, it's, it's very difficult to work on systems and, and systems add their own complexity. Uh, systems engineering is not just about gluing six things together. It's, it's actually about solving problems end to end and it's difficult to describe uh, if folks who are interested in engineering as, as a whole, like uh, probably, you know, will, will empathize. Um, but uh, let's look at what we would need to do from a systems perspective within, say, a warehouse that distributes bread. Uh, as you've seen, bread distribution happens in these trays and stacks. And in a normal warehouse, you would have aisles of, uh, of these trays and stacks lying around. And uh, what would happen is a truck would come from a bakery with say stacks of white bread. And so you would pull off a stack from that bakery uh, truck and each slot or, or stack over here would be a stack going to say a store, right? Like a Safeway or an Albertsons or a Costco or a 7-Eleven. And so a store does not want 900 white bread. And so you'd have somebody with a stack of 900 white bread, putting two white bread here, three white bread there, four white bread here, five white bread there, and just like walk the entire aisle, a set of aisles in the warehouse, and fulfill orders, you know, that would make this store's order a little bit more complete. Then a Russian rye bread would uh, come up from the Russian rye bakery. And then somebody would pick out a full stack of Russian rye bread and put two here, put three there, put three there, kind of walk in a sneaking pattern up and down this line. Uh, just to help people sort of contextualize this, the core problem there is to take an unmixed stack of one type of item and, and, and distribute it into you know, small granular orders and to continue to do that. And so there's a few problems here, right? One of the first problems is, well, you have to do the job, and move around to do the job. And so what we do over there is um, we wanted to have robot mobility there are many ways in which we can add robot mobility. We can have mobile bases, we can have flying drones, but flying drones can't really carry big robots at this point. Um, we can have um, hovercraft, I mean, you can get creative. Uh, we decided to go with a slightly more conventional system, which was uh, linear rails, uh, primarily for safety. Uh, when you have uh, fully unconstrained mobile robots, safety becomes a very big challenge because you can't, the robots could, there could be a bug in your code, they could end up in a random location. If robots are on a rail, at least you know for sure that, uh, that they're gonna be you know, somewhere along that rail. 
and it becomes much easier to engineer safety. Uh, it, it becomes much easier to enable human robot interaction. Great. So we've got linear mobility. We put some robots, small robots to pick small things, big robots to pick big things and make pallets. That's fantastic. You can buy this stuff. I think people have been building this stuff for decades. Uh, one of the challenges that comes after this is, is gripper design. And um, if there's folks who've uh, done a bit of uh, robotics, probably are aware that grippers are very consequential. That being said, I, I would like to share that uh, when, as a human being, uh, I think if I have a spatula and a pair of chopsticks, I can pick a lot of relevant objects. And if I also have a vacuum cleaner, I can pick a variety of other objects. And so while grippers are important, I think it's, it's the categorical type of the gripper that is more important. And it's very critical to, to think about manipulation, not from the lens of the gripper, uh, but from the lens of, of, of the graspability criterion. And uh, we made a very active effort to work on a manipulation in a hardware agnostic manner. And um, Harry's gonna cover a little bit of this as well, but just to sort of set the context, grippers are important, but it's actually very, very important that we can work with any gripper at all. And I do not think there is a magic gripper that solves all the problems on earth. In fact, they could be the best way to sort of think about grippers is let's design algorithms that work with any gripper so that we can mix and match grippers and have 8 million types of grippers and fine tune them in a very easy manner if we see fit. So keeping that in mind, we have the hardware set up. The robots are ready to do their job. Next comes the problem of doing things like picking, packing bread. This is where uh, we need to have computer vision because you still have to see the item. You have force control. Um, we use a model-based uh, approach, which actually builds upon a lot of the work that Osama Khatib did in his lab at Stanford. And uh, a model-based approach relies heavily on, on building a simulated context of the environment, uh, on, on running uh, sort of predictive control methods to identify how to operate in the environment without colliding with items, without uh, sort of squishing items, being gentle. It works, as you've seen. Next level up is to also enable that human-robot interaction. Human-robot interaction is a pretty broad field. There have been decades of research into this. Uh, I think what we realized is when you go into the real world, a lot of those decades of research in the lab don't readily transfer. And it's a long, interesting conversation, which I'll save um, for Q&A if somebody's interested. But uh, human-robot interaction in the real world is nothing like almost anything I've seen coming out of any lab, uh, let's put it that way. And uh, solving is extremely hard, very tedious, and it will take a long time to talk about it, but it's hard and, and it's very interesting uh, to, to see how humans uh, interact with robots in production. Great. So to quickly summarize, our approach uh, to robotics in the real world has been to say, we're gonna take something that looked tedious, manual, Right. We're going to work within the constraints and the confines of the system, which keeps the cost down, keeps our velocity view uh, production high. We're going to build out a full stack system, including the hardware and all the cool controls and the machine learning. And at the very level, the top level, make it very easy for people to interact with, control and coordinate the system. Good. But this is a rendering, and as all roboticists know, it's very easy to make renderings. It's uh, it's very hard to produce stuff that that, that uh, you know works in the real world. So um, I'm going to sh share a few videos of what works and dig into the other sections of the talk. But before I do that, I did want to uh, you know call out, uh, say special thanks to Osama. I think a lot of the work that he did in in model based control has been absolutely critical. Uh, the tricky part with uh, some of the model-based control stuff is uh, it's it's very it's very difficult to implement in 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 in, 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 in with all sorts of constraints. Um, it's a, it's an excellent framework for thinking about abstraction and simulated worlds. Uh, mapping that simulation to reality, oof, yeah, tough. All sorts of problems need to be solved, and we uh, you know are fortunate to have the opportunity to work on those. Um, I think having 
contextual awareness, so there's environmental awareness, real-time sensor integration into the simulation is really important. Uh, having the sense of touch and force control is absolutely critical. I could not imagine deploying robots in the real world without force control. Uh, Multi-robot collaboration can be very, very important in certain use cases. Humans are, are bimanual and um, there are many human work areas that are designed to necessitate bimanual operation. Uh, one tiny little thing I would like to call out is uh, a multi-robot collaboration, uh, you know, and, and I know there's some academic research on it, uh, is, is not when two robots, you know, mutually exclusively operate. A multi-robot collaboration is, is, is when robots actually collaborate in a, in a non-mutually exclusive manner. And, and so they, they do the same job together while dynamically interacting with each, each other, uh, possibly even collaboratively manipulating an object. Things are great when you're in free space, waving around, not touching. When you're touching each other, it's a completely different story. Simulations also break down because contact simulation is a still relatively unsolved problem. Cool. So agnostic robotics speaks for itself. We want all our methods to work in any robot gripper, any mobility platform, any camera, just about whatever. And, and uh, this is a very difficult problem. It's easier said than done. And the reason it's easier said than done is not because our theoretical frameworks can't uh, concern robots. It's because uh, the robot manufacturers have spent 40 years uh, sort of adapting their robot hardware uh, to, to highly customized applications in mass manufacturing. And a lot of times there's just physical constraints that, that make it difficult for us to be truly agnostic. Even if the theory says, hey, I have this great equation which should work on all robots, it just does not work on some robots. And you have to do all sorts of interesting things to make sure the cool equation or the cool neural network actually works on different robots. Finally, uh, we do machine learning. Of course, machine learning is data-driven, uh, but uh, we've spent a lot of time you know, trying to sort of position ourselves um, to, to be able to leverage uh, you know, more formal optimization methods that maybe reduce our reliance on data and, and allow us to operate in a slightly more um, I would say category by category uh, model. And what I mean when I say that is uh, a, a naive uh, sort of approach towards machine learning would just to exhaustively mine data. And assuming you have infinite time, infinite computational power, infinite money and infinite data, you can solve any problem with machine learning. Um, that's uh, more infinities than I think all of human civilization has disposal to. And so uh, you know, sometimes you have to solve problems in machine learning without infinity at your disposal. And uh, in order to do that, there's some interesting tips and tricks, you know, where uh, we think about problems in a structured way. Um, uh, we also need to have guarantees on safety. With robotic safety is a very, very huge thing. Uh, it, it becomes uh, very real when uh, people are overworked, um, sleepy, operating next to robots that could basically cause real damage. And so machine learning needs to be a little bit uh, data sparse, effective, predictable, and safe. So I said a lot of things. Uh, let, me, let me actually map those into, into uh, a demonstration here. And so when we think about robot dexterity, I think the first part about robot dexterity is the ability uh, to pick and place anything and everything. And what you're going to see over here is a robot. Uh, this is a classic level two um, smart robot in a box. Ouch. And uh, I, it uh, is presented with just about any object. It has never seen any of these objects. It has uh, not even seen any type of object similar to what it's seeing here. Um, and uh, the vision system needs to identify how to pick it. Black objects are hard. It's not just about picking, it's also about placing. Notice it has that little gentle sense of touch. It's good enough to even place a marker on its, uh, on its side. Um, picking and placing, even with a level two system is extremely hard. Some objects are very challenging. The robot needs to understand, adapt, try again. Uh, being hardware agnostic, like I mentioned, was very critical. So whether we're using a fingertip gripper, or a suction gripper, whether we're picking boxes, or slotting machine parts. This is, by the way, non-convex, multi-peg and multi-hole, slightly harder into a foamy surface with high friction. It's much harder than peg and hole, classical formulation. Um, you know, we need to do this kind of stuff. We need to pick out of trays, out of boxes, have robots moving around. Um, 
some of our robots play 3D Tetris. This is mixed case palletizing, essentially with a sequence of boxes. And when the boxes are uniform, it's easy. But as you'll see, it starts to get harder when you start getting random boxes. And the robot has to reason about this in basically in real time. And these are like impossibly hard problems to solve and make sure that uh, it builds nice 3D Tetris palettes that don't topple over. We have a hard constraint on human safety. We have a human interacting with the robot. In this particular case, actually messing with the robot. Um, we don't kick our robots like Boston Dynamics did. But I think uh, we're a little bit nicer. We come with a little wand and poke things out of the way, sometimes block their sensors, um, sometimes uh, artificially prevent them from uh, doing their job. And what you're seeing over here is, is uh, the fact that our systems work in real time. Uh, in fact, here's um, somebody um, uh, from our team is just trying to mess with the robot and just shaking the robot. And if you'll notice, the robot still manages to do its picks. And uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that uh, one needs to solve for uh, in, in the real world. If you can do things like this, you, know, you can actually build the confidence to go out in the real world. And having extremely constrained, well bolted down environments with the light shining perfectly, everything took five days to calibrate. If you're working like that, it just doesn't work, trust me. It just will never work. Um, so you know, here we see an instance of the bread packing again with the force control. We can't just like what I would call suck and drop objects. Here's a tricky one where you're picking trays, but now you're looking from the perspective of the camera and you notice you can't even see the handle and you actually need that force control to kind of find your way into the handle. If you didn't have force control, it's impossible. Each one of these trays is like warped and deformed and whatnot. And now you can kind of see the bumpy granular non-convex surface slotting into another bumpy granular non-convex surface with a semi-deformable object. Again, just a glimpse of the things that, uh, that, that have been done over the past, I would say, a few years. These were things that were, to my knowledge, outstanding research problems in, in, um, in academia that actually have been outstanding for decades even. And, and I think uh, we're fortunate enough to be in a position where we've made some progress on these, still not totally solved, I would say. Uh, but uh, the path ahead um, is, is, is uh, upon us and there's lots of things to do. Cool. So uh, I'd be happy to hop back, by the way, talk a little bit more about the details. Couldn't get into too granular detail, but uh, I could talk about some nuances once we get to the QA section. Okay. That's, that's a quick introduction into dexterity, into our perspective on intelligent dexterous um, robotics. Uh, I see there's a note in the chat. Science, uh, no, this isn't. After a century of telling ourselves the same half truths about the benefits of automation, I would like to see us in STEM fields acknowledging uh, the larger socioeconomic picture that has been known for so long. Absolutely, I, I'm a great believer in this. Thank you for the comment. It's, when we're doing robotics, I think it's, it's very important to understand we're not doing it in a vacuum. We need to be responsible here and we need to find a, an actual active path into society that is constructive. Really appreciate the comment. Cool. Um, I shall hand it over to, uh, to Jonathan. Jonathan? All right, thanks a lot. How would you like to take over the screen? And just uh, let me give a quick introduction. Uh, Jonathan Kuck uh, did his PhD from Stanford. Uh, he's worked on a wide variety of optimization and machine learning methods. Uh, I think when he was coming to Dexterity, we had a conversation and it was like, uh, the recruiting process for Dexterity is a little bit interesting. We, a lot of other companies, you know, they write down a role and when you come join the company, they say, hey, it's your job to do this. At Dexterity, we usually talk to folks and we say, hey, what would you like to do? And let's try to invent a role that plays to your strengths and allows you to leverage what you've done in the past. And so we were talking to Jonathan and I posed a few interesting problems and he caught onto this uh, impossibly hard problem, which uh, it's really hard. Uh, and, and he's gonna talk about it, uh, which, is, which is to uh, build very stable, interesting palettes and pack lots of boxes and random uh, presentation order um, and play 3D Tetris. Um, he's an extremely smart guy, 
also happened to be an Olympic silver medalist, a very humble guy. He'll, uh, you'll never find him bragging about himself. So I felt it was uh, important for me to brag about him for a few seconds here. Uh, Jonathan, uh, please uh, go ahead and, 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 and take over the presentation. I really appreciate your participation here. Thanks a lot, Samir. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for the intro, Samir. Thanks a lot for having us all here. So I've been at Dexterity for going on almost a year now, and I work in problems, like Samir said, centered around optimization, machine learning, and perception. Uh, before joining Dexterity, I did my PhD at Stanford, and I worked on core machine learning problems with Stefano Ehrman. Um, in particular, I focused on probabilistic inference, combining classical techniques with learning and robotic perception applications. So today I'm going to be talking about the pallet building robot that we've built at Dexterity. Pallet, pallet building is backbreaking work. Uh, these boxes you can see they're being placed on the pallets by the robot uh, can be heavy and people are lifting them all day long. And it leads to a high injury rate and a high turnover rate with workers. So it's just hard to find people to perform these tasks and this impacts the whole supply chain like Samira is mentioning. I, I think this is a particularly difficult case because you see these pallets are tall and the boxes can be quite heavy. So it's just not a job that people want to be doing. So this slide shows the core problem that we're solving. We need to place a diverse set of objects on the wooden platform depicted on the left to form a complete stable pallet as shown on the right. These boxes are all different shapes and sizes and we need to be sure that they fill the available volume without tipping over. So please note that this pallet on the right was actually built by our robots. And besides being physically taxing, figuring out how to place boxes so that a pallet is dense and stable is also actually difficult for a human to do. So let me give a quick overview of this, this section of the talk. Uh, first, we'll talk about how pallet building is really a fundamental operation inside of supply chains and the logistics industry. Uh, then I'll talk about bin packing or the mathematical problem statement of building a pallet in simulation. Then I'll talk about how we solve the problem at Dexterity at a high level and what, what the core problems are to actually develop an algorithm that solves the robotic bin packing algorithm, uh, bin packing problem in the real world. And then I'll wrap up by talking about some of the ongoing work we're doing and, and fun and exciting problems that, that we'll be solving in the near future. So first off, pallet building is really a fundamental operation in the supply chain. Let's start off with a high level simplified overview of, of what a standard supply chain looks like. So what, what's the supply chain about? Goods are being manufactured in factories and we want to get them to consumers who use the goods. So we could have a toothpaste factory, a shampoo factory, a reading glass factory that all specialize in making one type of good. Then these goods are routed to distribution centers that get all of the goods. They rearrange the goods into different orders. They go out to different stores, 7-Eleven, Walgreens, Trader Joe's. And that's where the consumers go to get the goods. So let's zoom in on that distribution center. A distribution center is basically a huge cache for physical goods that just resorts them and holds on to them until a store needs to be replenished. Okay, now let's look at some pictures inside a real distribution center. One thing that's fun about Dexterity is you get to go into a warehouse and, and see what this stuff actually looks like. So this picture is, is of the input to the cache. On the left, can you see my mouse? Hopefully, no. Okay, the left side of the image shows the truck unloading bays. Oh, we, uh, can a lot. we can see it now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so these are all the truck unloading bays on the left side of the warehouse. This is, this is really the input to the cache. Um, the goods come off there and then they, and this is the storage portion of the cache. This is a semi-automated storage portion. You can see like conveyor belts, but it's not fully automated. People can go inside of it. There's really a range of automation inside of the storage center storage portion. So this picture is a, is a non-automated storage center. Just got aisles of 
stacks of boxes. It basically looks like a Costco or a Sam's Club, but maybe 10 times bigger than a standard Costco. And then this picture shows the output of the cache. So you've got, you've got a sliding conveyor belts with goods coming down. You've got a pallet here that has to be built before being put on a truck. And on the right side of the image, you can kind of see just a long, uh, a long aisle of truck loading bays for the outgoing trucks that are heading to the stores. Okay, so a pallet is, is really a fundamental type in the supply chain. Objects are transported on pallets before they're put on trucks or trains or ships or whatever to be routed around. Besides being used for transportation, they're also used for storage. So this is again, a, that picture of the, the not automated storage section of this distribution center. And you can see that these are, we have four pallets high here throughout the entire row. So besides transportation, they're also just storage inside of a warehouse. Okay, so this is a zoom in on the picture of the pallets in the storage section of the warehouse. And you'll note, you'll note that these pallets are homogenous. The boxes are all the same size sitting on the pallets. That's because they came in from the factories that make one type of object. But this outgoing pallet is heterogeneous. It contains a lot of different sizes of boxes. So it's important that we uh, develop a bin packing algorithm that can, that can handle a high diversity in object types, which makes the problem a lot more difficult. So just to go back to the high level, high level image, uh, you might wonder like, okay, maybe we can just uh, figure out what, what, even if, if the problem is hard, we can use a supercomputer to solve it, but like, and cache the results. That's not really true. So on every day and with every type of object, you might have a different order. So we can't compute how to build a very complex pallet use over a week and then just reuse that because the orders are dynamic every day. They can change based on what people have bought in stores and what a particular Trader Joe's or CVS needs to replenish. So we really have to be able to, to develop a, a solution that can efficiently solve this problem uh, for these customers. Okay, so that's why bin packing is important for logistics and for the supply chain. Now let's talk about uh, the mathematical formulation of the problem and what's been, what's been done uh, so far today. So first off, let's talk about a simplified setting, just the, the one, one dimensional bin packing problem. Then we'll talk about a quick overview of 3D bin packing. So the 1D bin packing comes in a variety of flavors, but one of the, one of the, the simplest setting is the knapsack problem. You're given a set of positive real numbers. And you want to find the subset who's su with a maximum sum such that it's smaller than another positive real number. So basically, you have a bunch of lengths, and you want to find the set with the sum of such that the sum of their lengths is largest but smaller than another length. So this orange set here highlights what might be the solution to this problem. I don't actually know if it is because I didn't want to spend the time checking all of the solutions. So so why is it hard? It's an NP hard problem, and it's hard for the reason that all NP hard problems are hard because of a, a you have to enumerate an exponentially large number of items in the worst case. So every object can be included or excluded from a set, and because of this, you have to enumerate over an, an exponentially large number of sets in the worst case to exactly solve the problem. That's the standard setup for any NP hard problem. Okay, but we don't actually care about the one dimensional knapsack problem. We, can, we care about 3D bin packing. It's not just about finding a set of objects. It's about uh, choosing where to place these objects in three dimensional space also. We also have to satisfy some other real world constraints to make this work on a robot. So let's talk about 3D bin packing problem. Also, just please don't actually read this slide. Uh, the point is that this is a very well-studied problem, uh, but people still don't know how to even clearly articulate the core problems that need to be solved. I grabbed this from a 2013 uh, survey paper of bin packing, and these are just uh, the number of different names that have been given to slight variations of the problem. I, I think it's kind of funny, actually. The differences between these problems is basically how much diversity is there in the object types that are packed 
How much diversity is there in the bin types that the objects are packed into? And what exactly is the objective that's being optimized? But there's, there's just a lack of clarity in, in how to actually focus on the problem rather than solving the core problem. Now let's contrast this with, with uh, how the real world applicability of these 163 papers in this survey paper. So how many of them consider stability? Just to preface, stability is a prerequisite of, an, of a bin packing algorithm actually working on a robot. Less than 40% consider stability in any form, and less than 15% consider a non-trivial form of stability. So most of the papers that consider stability, just look at the support between boxes. I mean, physical support. What's the fraction of the area, of the surface area of the bottom of an object that, is, that physically touches the top of another object? And note that number one, this is overly restrictive. You could have a box that's supported on either ends, forming a bridge. It's actually very stable, uh, but it might not have even 50% support. At the same time, focusing exclusively on physical support isn't even sufficient to guarantee stability. You could have a, a tower of boxes that kind of cantilever out into space where the, the center of mass of the top box isn't even supported by the boxes below them. Okay, so besides stability, there are also a number of other uh, important constraints that are necessary for a bin packing algorithm to work in the real world that also aren't considered. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next section. Uh, Jonathan, can I interrupt? Oh, yeah. So we might have five to 10 minutes before we wrap up. So, so if we, I, I'm not sure how you plan it, but I mean, I guess some people might stay after, but I think, you know, we'll probably cross a one hour uh, gap at that point. Oh, okay. Got it. Well, in that case, I'm just going to start going pretty fast here. <laughs> okay. So let's see. There are a variety of techniques that are used to solve the, this problem. Classical techniques, such as mixed integer programming that allow you to leverage all of the work that's gone into these solvers in the past. Also framing the problem in more of a domain specific manner and using search or simulated annealing. Also a little bit of work on learning. Um, so what do we do here at Dexterity? Well, we combine classical optimization techniques with machine learning. Classical optimization allows us to have a, a highly performance solution on day one without any data. Machine learning lets us uh, Im Im improve the solution from there. We also integrate with the perception stack. So. Sorry to go so quickly here, but I have to keep moving. So what are some of the constraints that we have to deal with in the real world? Uh, we deal with an online problem where we don't know the full set of objects. Many papers don't consider this approach. We might, may only know the next N objects, basically a camera's place upstream on a conveyor belt. We have to, to, we have to run our algorithm in real time. Uh, the algorithm cannot be the bottleneck to the robot because our throughput is very important to our customers. We need to be able to handle constraints uh, with high flexibility so that we avoid any collisions between the robot's arm or the box that's being placed on the pallet. And we need to be able to, to have a, an, intelligent stability, an intelligent set of stability constraints. And then we need the algorithm to be robust to real world noise. This is relatively easy at dexterity because we specialize in making precise placements, but it's still something we have to deal with. So what's the output? We build, we build high quality, stable, dense pallets. And we can do this in real time for uh, real world setups of highly diverse uh, object types. And not only can we do it in simulation, but we can do it on the robot uh, as I showed at the beginning of the presentation. So let's talk about ongoing, ongoing work and problems here at Dexterity. So, Combining combinatorial optimization with machine learning is an exciting direction that's received a lot of research attention re recently. Yashua Benjio recently wrote a nice survey paper that talks about what's, what's been done to date. And here at Dexterity, we have a lot of directions to, to push this approach. So let me tell a quick story about, uh, so re recently a customer came in and I saw our solution. They're like, this is great. We want to put it in our stores. But we have, we have another problem for you. We'd like you to take any random input sequence and then build a very clean, neat palette 
such that objects are have a very specific order. The reason for this is so that the at the output store, when someone is restocking the shelves, they can walk around and efficiently unload one item and then another. So really that what they want to do is solve bin packing followed by a traveling salesman problem. So across the supply chain, we have many optimization problems that can be stuck together and jointly optimized. And we can use machine learning to specialize our solutions to a particular data distribution of problems that come up in the real world. Besides doing this at a higher level, there's also a lot of opportunities to chain together optimization problems with motion control, collision avoidance, and uncertainty handling in the perception stack. And also we need to make our uh, solutions robust at scale. This means better simulations from physical interactions to uh, the complete supply chain. And we have to be able to handle uh, long tail events and distribution shift to make our, our solutions really reliable. So just to wrap up here, sorry, this has been so, so, so rushed. Um, we have a lot of fun problems to work on and the solutions are really in a lot of demand. When I was visiting a distribution center, the company told us that all of our competition and, and no one had a mixed case palletization solution that could actually work. And they, they just wanted our solution on the ground right away. So it's great to be working on these problems and to see all of the potential for future improvement as we optimize across the complete supply chain. So, okay, that was very fast, but uh, so, sorry for the rushed, rushed slides there. No worries, Jonathan, thanks for sharing. So, you know, we are maybe at the one hour mark. So maybe we can take a few questions for the audience. So I know Harry, you also had a part of the talk. You know, we would love to hear you, but I think you're also constrained by yeah. the- it's all good. So let, let's see, you know, if we have any questions. No questions, no comments. Uh, I have a question. So um, I guess one sort of question for me to understand uh, the overall picture is, um, so why is it that like, like, uh, like, the the solution is centered on this form factor of like pallets where it's just like freestanding on a, on a base like why not put them in like giant boxes or something isn't it like you don't have to worry about stability as much in that case like what why is it that this is what um what is um, it? yeah so i think there's there's a few things uh, one is uh, giant boxes are are very difficult to load because uh, you'll have to reach all the way inside the box uh, which is which is pretty tough uh, two is giant boxes are expensive. Uh, three is giant boxes in order to actually have them uh, be heavy duty enough so that they don't just like fall apart when you put stuff in there. Uh, I mean, basically the, the these pallets get very, very heavy, right? Like cardboard boxes just won't work. Like these pallets sometimes can weigh tons. And so the pallet is just a pretty standard form factor. It also needs to integrate with loading equipment that loads it into a truck. So, so there's, there's quite a few reasons why. I see. Okay. Thank you. Question is, how do you detect and localize pallets? That's just with computer vision. But I guess that's not very accurate. That's why you need your touch sensing or some kind of force feedback to come in. Yeah, that's correct. Great. Uh, any other questions? I'll just leave people with a few uh, fun videos in the background. Well, we're... There's one question on the chat from Leo. So I guess the summary is in short or medium term, is machine learning a fundamental addition to robotic manipulation or just a performance boost? Uh, I'm sorry, could you could we repeat that? So it's in the chat, Samir. Zoom seems to be hanging on me here. Yeah, but, so it's asking whether machine learning in the short or medium term futures, is it just something which gives a small performance boost or is it something a fundamental addition to robotic manipulation?
Uh, sorry, folks. I, I think my Zoom just uh, just crashed. Um, I think let me just. Uh, is Jonathan, maybe you could take the question. I, my Zoom just crashed. I, I need to just figure out what this thing is going. Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the combinatorial problems I was talking about, classical solutions can give you good results. But sometimes we have to deal with this. So for the example where we don't know the future sequence of boxes, we want to use a machine learning technique to understand what the distribution of future boxes that we could potentially see is. So that's an example of where it's important to combine uh, machine learning approaches immediately to get some baseline understanding of, of what, what the best thing to do is. Uh, if you know what the full sequence of boxes you're, you're working on an offline problem, then yeah, you can use a combinatorial optimization, a, a, a classical combinatorial optimization technique to get a good solution. And machine learning would give more of a boost rather than being strictly necessary. Cool. Well, thanks. So, uh, you know, thanks, Jonathan, Samir, and Harry. It was great having you, and thanks for the talk. You know, Harry, I hope we find another opportunity to invite you to talk more about your system at some point. Sounds and, good. You know, so I guess there is a Q&A, I guess, 